Reptiles are a group that are not only prevalent today, but are also the focal points for many portions of Earth's history, even being the first group of vertebrates that didn't need water for anything other than to drink. But as it turns out, we don't actually know how they got here. Now, reptiles are pretty much everywhere in the fossil record once they become commonplace. Hell, even showing their ties to mammals from what used to be termed the mammal-like reptiles from the Permian. Now we all know the different paths they took. We know how vertebrates in general first flopped onto land, and the logical derivation would dictate that fish gave rise to amphibians, amphibians gave rise to reptiles, and reptiles gave rise to mammals. But that amphibian to reptile transition is astoundingly poorly known. Now this gap in the tetrapod record was first noticed in the 1950s by American paleontologist Alfred Romer and has thus been termed Romer's Gap. So first let's take a quick overview into the story of tetrapods so that we can put this missing chapter into context. During the Devonian period, early Sarcopterygians, or lobefin fish, that were living in shallow waters began developing more mobile and stronger front limbs, meaning they could have short sporadic bursts on land similar to mudskipper fish. Eventually, this evolution continued until the vertebrates fully broke onto land for the first time in the mid-Devonian with stem tetrapods. These were essentially amphibian-like animals that looked pretty clumsy on land but could move across it and live outside of it for much longer nonetheless. Now eventually, this group would diverge into actual amphibians, who could live on land but needed water to retain moisture and lay their eggs in, with subsequent reptiles who solved that issue by laying hard-shelled eggs and growing moisture-retaining scales, and mammals who managed to work around the heavy temperature dependency of the previous two. Now where the confusion starts is around the end of the Devonian, 350 million years ago or so. This is around the time that Roma's Gap starts, and paleontologists worldwide have barely been able to find anything from the tetrapod fossil record. What's even stranger is the fact that this gap only seems to be with tetrapods with all other fossil content being in around the same sort of abundance as other time periods. Now this obviously raises several questions. Namely, how did tetrapods get to where they are today and why are they missing from this portion of the rock record? Well, a few theories have been put forward. The first one is that during this period, the conditions simply didn't favour fossilisation on land. Plant and invertebrate fossils are relatively rare anyway, and low atmospheric oxygen meant that tetrapods had to pause their conquering of the land. The problem with this particular theory comes from findings in Scotland that finally narrowed this gap a little. Five new locations have yielded multiple tetrapod fossils from near the beginning of the gap, with geochemical studies showing that the atmospheric oxygen at this point wasn't as low as first thought. It also shows that, at least locally, there doesn't appear to be a gap in diversity. Now again, this is only a specific area, so it might not have been the case everywhere, and again, this is from the very beginning of the gap, so it is far from solving the mystery. Another thing to consider here is the fact that this happens to coincide with one of the big five mass extinctions of Earth's history, with this one being the Endivonian. This was actually a series of pulses, of which the cause of is still unknown. It's mainly affected marine organisms, with land plants and most freshwater species remaining relatively unaffected. I say mostly because clearly our tetrapod ancestors cannot be found for a time after this, so there's a good chance that this severely hindered the vertebrates' attempt at fully conquering the land. This makes a lot of sense since diversity in the ocean returns to normal around the same sort of time that the gap ends. The two biggest question marks here though is, why did it only affect the vertebrates and how did they simply pick up where they left off? This is also not a case of preservational bias, as has been suggested in the past, since this bias would need to somehow be worldwide and we see plenty of other fossils from similar locations such as fish and plant matter, and if something is stopping even the land vertebrates from fossilising, you can bet your bottom dollar that a plant certainly won't fossilise. Now again, there has been the odd find within this gap, such as the early Carboniferous tetrapods Pederpes and Crassigyrinus, and the mid-Carboniferous fossils show that these groups had already split into amphibians and amniotes. Now again, a group of animals won't just pick up where they left off after their diversity is reduced by extinction, and the differences between tetrapods before and after the gap are not great enough to suggest that something major affected them. Not only that, there isn't anything that we can see that should stop these animals from fossilising, since the gap doesn't actually exist in any other group. Roma's Gap is such a strange and underrated discussion point, since it's actually one of the biggest mysteries in land vertebrate story that hasn't been solved in nearly 70 years. Unfortunately, I don't have the answers either. I can just put forward as to why it's such a weird thing. 
What I can answer though is today's question, which comes from Derek K8523, who has asked, Bacillosaurus versus Mosasaurus, neutral site, who wins? Yes, a classic base off question. So you have the massive aquatic reptile Mosasaurus versus the giant predatory whale Bacillosaurus. Now for this question I'm going to be assuming that we're talking the largest species of each genus, making Bacillosaurus up to 66 feet long and around 6 tons, and Mosasaurus at between 55 to 60 feet long but being much heavier at a potential 10 tons. So I think three main factors are being played here and that is weight, agility and jaws. Now with these in mind, despite a fairly even playing field in terms of bite force and how much I love whales, I'm afraid I'd have to give the win to Mosasaurus. Given its shorter length and ability for phenomenal acceleration, Mosasaurus would get the win on agility and speed slash power, and the larger mass gave Mosasaurus a weight advantage of a potential 4 tons. I hate to say it, but I think Mosasaurus gets an easy win here. Think I'm wrong? Let me know down in the comments and we can start a discussion about it. Otherwise, if you've liked this content, please consider liking and subscribing as it really would mean a lot to me. And I'll catch you guys next time.